Greetings, geeks. This is Stephen James from GeekLegacy.com, bringing you another installment of Retro Review. And today we will be taking a look at the original Wizards and Warriors on the NES. Now, up to this point, I have been playing games that are must-have titles, such as Metroid, Metal Gear, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, and so on. But this game doesn't exactly have that same swagger as the other titles I just mentioned, and we're going to talk about why. For starters, this game has a lot going on. Most platformers such as Super Mario Bros., Ninja Gaiden, Adventure Island, and even DuckTales, the progression from the beginning of the level to the end of the level is as simple as moving to the right with a few ascending and descending side route. Here, however, going to the right doesn't exactly mean you're at the end of the level. For instance, in level 1, you have to traverse through a network of trees in order to find the end. In the second level, you have to progress through a series of caves, only to find a certain path that will take you to the end. What you need to know is, expect to backtrack a lot. And I'm not necessarily a huge fan of backtracking, but that isn't a negative mark for this game. Next, let's talk about the controls. They really aren't that great, end of story. With platforming games, you want the controls to be tight and responsive, like Mega Man 2 or the aforementioned Ninja Gaiden, which also means all failures are pinned on the player and not the game. Here, your character slides around when running with momentum, and oddly enough, some enemies don't need to be killed by swinging your sword. Just the mere poking will destroy certain enemies along the way. The big problem is, however, some of those enemies aren't necessarily different from other enemies. So, you will be confused as far as which ones can be jousted to death, and which ones you actually have to swing your sword at. The controls, as I said, aren't great, but I have played with far worse. One complaint that I had was the plethora of inventory items that were necessary to progress through the game, but lack of minimap or any indication of these items. In the first level, I picked up throwing daggers, two pairs of boots, and a shield, but found nothing in level 2. Luckily, one of the boots that I picked up allowed me to walk on lava, which was needed in order to even stand a chance in level 3, so I can only imagine something vital was left behind in some of the other levels. Some sort of checklist or even a mini-map or anything would have been nice. Just any type of indication that there is a key item on the map that needs to be picked up in order to progress. The gameplay itself is actually pretty fun. As I mentioned, you are to progress the level, defeat the end boss, and save the damsel in distress. The game is pretty generous when it comes to continues because you essentially have an unlimited amount of resets, but three lives per continue. What I did notice is, if you lose a life, you start at the exact same spot in which you died, but if you have to use a continue, you will begin at the beginning of the level. I really appreciate this fact because most platformers will either reset you at a random checkpoint with missing items, or make you start the level all over again. This is a forgiving and appreciative feature, regardless of how you look at it. The music in this game is mediocre at best. You get a really annoying tone whenever your health is low, which overtakes the music and doesn't stop until you either die or get more health. None of the songs here are really memorable, but most of them are really annoying. And on top of that, they loop really early, which means you're going to be hearing the same notes over and over again. Luckily, each level has a different song, so at least they're not too repetitive. One little fun fact about the music here is that the game was composed by David Wise, who was also known for composing the soundtracks for Battletoads and Donkey Kong Country on the Super Nintendo, both of which have amazing soundtracks. So, this game tries really hard in presenting a fun and quality experience, but I really feel like it came up short in some areas. I mentioned how the controls were a bit sloppy, not totally responsive, but not terrible on the same breath. The game progression was all over the place, and the hit detection was just very random. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video review, it's not the best game out there, but I will add on to that remark by saying that you won't be terribly disappointed by playing this. As far as ratings go, I rate this game 3 out of 5 stars. Again, it's not a great title, but some players might find more enjoyment out of it than others, and it's not that far off from being a must-play game. It's just not a title that you must own. Well, that's all we have for you today, so be sure to check out Geek Legacy at www.geeklegacy.com, Follow them on Twitter, follow them on Facebook, and also be sure to get throw a follow my way on the Twitters. Once again, my name is Stephen Janes. Thank you for watching this edition of Retro Review, and as always, geeks, game on.